And now, it's time to sit back and enjoy the Two True Freaks Internet Radio Broadcast. Attention, people, Earth. Do not resist us. All who oppose us shall be annihilated. We command the most powerful army of monsters in the universe. They are sure to defeat your Earth monsters. All those who are hearing this are now under the control of the Earth Destruction Directive. Hello everyone and welcome to Earth Destruction Directive. I am your host as always, Mr. Luke Giaconetti. I'd like to thank everyone for downloading and listening to the show today. Hope everyone enjoyed our last episode, which happened to be episode 100, where my brother Jason and I took a look back at Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla all the way back from 1974. And uh, we have got a treat for you today. And uh, I, I do mean we... In a very real and literal sense this time, as I am joined by a new guest, first-time guest, a long-time podcaster, and I have uh, recorded with him several times before on other shows, just not on Earth Destruction Directive. Uh, let's give a big Earth Destruction Di- Directive welcome to my friend, Mr. Thomas DJ. How are you doing, Thomas? I am doing fine as we go from the sublime to the ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that that is an accurate uh, uh, description, I believe, of the film we are going to be talking about. Because, uh, ladies and gentlemen, set your way back machine to 1967, and uh, it's time for the X from Outer Space, aka Giant Space Monster Giala, the uh, only, the only uh, entry in the Daikaiju uh, genre from. Uh, noted uh, studio Shochiku, which did did this one and then stayed out of the giant monster game for about four decades. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! So uh, you know, uh, Thomas, you're you're on this episode because you had reached out to me and said, "Hey, would you do X the Unknown?" I'd I'd like to talk about that. So uh, why don't you give us a little bit of your your background with this movie? Well. Back in the old days, there was, um, you know, in the Age of Steam, when dinosaurs ruled the Earth, and there were only three television stations on Earth, or at least in America. On Channel 7, the ABC affiliate here in New York City, they had a great, great show called The 430 Movie, which ran from Monday Mm -hmm. to Friday, at 4.30 to 6 o'clock. And it was a repository of all sorts of crap. And they had, like, Planet of, <laughs> they had Planet of the Apes Week. They had Go Ape Week. And they had... Uh, they cobbled together an entire week out of the Fly movies. Which I still marvel at. But my favorite weeks when because everything was a theme week yes so my favorite theme weeks were of course when they did either godzilla week self-explanatory right or they did what they called monster week and monster week invariably was made up of uh monster from a prehistoric planet with with the gapas uh the Gappa are angry. Everybody, please the remember, Gappa, Gappa angry. angry. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, usually, Frankenstein conquered the conquers the world. Another classic. And usually, a Gamera movie or two. Hmm. And every once in a while, this one, the X from Outer Space, which even. At young Tom's age in in the 1970s, watching these films unapologetically and loving them, real young Tom realized this one's a little bit poo. (laughs) It's kind of silly, and part of it is because of the of the monster design. Mm -hmm. Because I I remember the monster design long after I forgot everything else about this movie. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, he, he um, you know, the, the uh, when, when we talked about uh, Godzilla vs. Megalon, uh, Joe Butler and I uh, talked about the, the tie-in comic for Godzilla vs. Megalon, which called Gigan uh, Boradan and referred to him as a big black mm-hmm. chicken. Yeah. Uh, so I think in this case, Giala is like a big green chicken, right? He, Essentially? He's a big green double chinned chicken <laughs> with a flying saucer for a head with two antenna and a periscope coming out of it. Mm-hmm. Am I accurate? Yeah, that, that is a very accurate description of Giala. He is, uh, um, With, by you the know, way, there, there's very, some, yeah. very, very visible seams on the costumes. <laughs> yeah. You, could you tell, really, you know, just from watching this, that perhaps uh, Shochiku, this was not really their level, their, their area of expertise. No. You know? <laughs> and from what I can, I, I, I have this pretty... Um, firm belief that there was a German co-production mm. in place because there are three prominent German characters in it. Yes, including the prerequisite white woman that that has the whim whams for the the Asian hero. Of course, Lisa. Um, yeah, Lisa, Doctor uh, Lisa, Doctor Lisa. Yes, Doctor Lisa. She has a last um, name. They mention it. But anyway, no. It it it's just Doctor Lisa. I mean, it's it's a first name, it's a last name, it's anything you need it to be, right? You know, it's like right. It's like Cher or Prince, you know. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, see, I I love that you have that background because this one completely, I managed to completely avoid as a kid somehow. I I knew mm-hmm. of Giala. I had mm-hmm. seen. There's a there was some I I for the life of me my brother probably knows this and he's probably yelling at the at the uh, podcast right now, <laughs> but there was some like network uh, clip show special that we had on tape that had scenes from all these different science fiction films and there is a quick shot of Giala in it and I always wondered what the heck is are you that? sure it wasn't it came from Hollywood? It might have been it came from Hollywood. It could have been that. Did that also feature scenes from, like, Close Encounters of the Third Kind and This Island Earth and stuff like that? Oh, no, 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 no. It, mm. it Came From Hollywood was the movie that resulted from somebody thinking, let's make a movie of the Golden Turkey Awards. Mmm, yes. And we all know what a good idea that was by the whole <laughs> It Came From Hollywood franchise that it grew out of it. <laughs> yeah. But, um... But I, you know, I, so, but it wasn't really until I got Jeff Rovin's uh, classic book, The Encyclopedia of Monsters, mm-hmm. that I kind of, I kind of put two and two together. I said, I bet you that monster from that old clip show was this Giala, this extra right. matter space. And, you know, there, and, and it wasn't really easy to find on, uh, on, on, on VHS or on early days of DVD. So it, it just kind of, it was always out there and I always wanted to track it down and, Eventually, I did get it the uh, the Blu-ray set that we'll we'll talk about that that um, Criterion the Criterion um, I mean, that, collection. Made the Criterion a copy collection, of it's this. like the cri- Yeah, we had the Criterion Godzilla, and let's not forget that they also did Giala. That is just astounding, <laughs> you know. But uh, see, yeah, see, uh, so but this the thing was, is, Godzilla uh, yeah. is is a phenomena. <laughs> Godz- no, God, seriously, Godzilla was something yeah. very significant in the history of Japanese cinema, and it became a pop culture thing. He, the, the, the character transcended film to become this great pop culture icon. So I can understand the Criterion Collection doing a Godzilla box set. Absolutely. But, uh... Gilala? <laughs> Gilala didn't even uh, release theatrically in America. It no, went it was not to television. Yes, it did, and uh, yeah. So uh, you're you're absolutely right. Actually, although you know, a couple of Godzilla films did, did the same thing in that era too. In the in the uh, the mid oh, yeah, to late sixties, so. yeah. I think and, Son of uh, Godzilla and, was one. And Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster, I think, was the other one that went straight to television oh. as well. Right. 
Yeah, but uh, so uh, so, yeah, so the X from Outer Space uh, Japanese title is Uchu Daikaiju Giara. As I said, literally giant space monster Giara Giala. There's a lot of R and L sounds in there, so it's uh, (laughs) you know not a good not a good call. Um, Is made in uh, 1967, produced by Shochiku. Uh, released to Japanese theaters on March 25th, 1967, and as you referred to, Thomas, went to American television syndication via American International TV in 1968. Uh, our director is Kazui Nihamatsu. Uh, now, Nihamatsu, best known as actually an assistant director, he's worked with Akira Kurosawa, uh, Keisuke Kinoshita, and uh, a lot of times at uh, at Shochichu with uh, Masaki Kobayashi. Now, what I thought was interesting is that um, he would direct this film, and then in 1968 he would direct the film Genocide, which was known here in the West as War of the Insects, which is okay. also in that Criterion When Horror Came Horror Comes to Shochichu box set. So you get both of his. Uh, science fiction slash horror films with one purchase if you get that that uh, that criterion uh-huh. set. Uh, so we cast um, not a there's they're very interesting cast because normally you do like a Toho movie or something it's all the uh-huh. Toho regulars and a lot of these folks were Sho- Shochiku regulars but it's just not stuff that we've really seen here in the West much. Uh-huh. So uh, uh, we got Shunya Wazaki who plays Captain Sano. Mostly, he his credits on IMDb were for Chanbara, were for samurai films and other period mm-hmm. pieces. Uh, he did two lone wolf and cub movies, playing a diff- playing different characters. So, uh, I thought that was interesting. He popped up in Lone Wolf and Cub, mm-hmm. um, and then he would reappear in 2008 in Monster X Strike Back, Attack the G8 Summit, which is the pseudo follow up spoof of this movie that they put out. Like I said, about 40 years after the fact. Yes. The one they were trying to make bad. Yes, which which means it's not as funny as this one. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Sano, very much from the, the Toho school of the straight-laced hero in a mm. Japanese science fiction movie, you know. Um, uh, Peggy Neal, she plays the aforementioned Dr. Lisa. Uh, born in, uh, born in Biloxi, Mississippi. Uh, Peggy Neal actually went to university in Japan and became an actress. Uh, best known, I think, she stars with Sonny Chiba in uh, Agent X2 Underwater Operation. And uh, according to IMDb, she is uncredited in the Toho film from 1969, Latitude Zero. Which uh, I, I would have to go back and see. There are some, there are some white women in Latitude Zero. I'll have to go look at that one. Um, now this one I thought was interesting too. So in 2018... Uh, Neil appears as the character Dr. Mary Lisa Gleason in the film The Great Buddha Arrival. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that one, Thomas. No, no, I am not. So The Great Buddha Arrival, it's a it's an independent uh, Daikaiji film. It is a callback to this uh, legendary, unproduced, uh, very, very early Daikaiji film about a giant Buddha statue appearing in Japan. Okay. And so, but this name, Dr. Mary Lisa Gleason, is a combination of her character names in several movies that she appears in. <laughs> okay. So it's kind of a tribute. Yes, yes, I would. Uh, and and that, that's the only reason I think you would, you would cast her in that, is if somebody obviously must have been a fan of this and uh, Agent X2 and, and, and mm. so forth. Um, our other female lead, Machiko, is played by Itoka Harada. Um, several other credits, but unfortunately very, very little information. Um, no films that I recognize, uh, mm-hmm. when I was looking through the list. Now, um, what's, so she is still, still working today. Like, she still has credits even through, like, last year. So she is still doing stuff, which is, which is pretty cool. Okay. Our, uh, our communications officer and pseudo-comic relief, Miyamoto. Played by and Shinichi. Creeper. Don't forget Creeper. Oh, total creep. But it was the 60s, you know, so that was okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay to be a Creeper. <laughs> As an aside, it was not okay. It was just expected. Maybe that's probably the better way to say that. Yeah. Um, so uh, Miyamoto, played by uh, Shinichi. Uh, Yanagasawa, 
very prolific actor. He has credits dating all the way back to 1954. And just looking through some of these titles, they are a range of stuff. He's got uh, Chanbara, he's got straight drama, he's got comedy, he's got uh, this film for science fiction. Just very prolific actor with a lot of credits. And uh, the last person I do want to mention is Mike Danning, who plays uh, <laughs> Dr. Steen, or Stein, depending on which one you're li- which which uh, whether you're listening to the dub or the uh, or the, the the subtitles. Uh, all I could think of was the Halloween song Dr. Steen the entire time he was on screen. <laughs> he builds funny creatures, he lets them run into the night, they become great rock musicians, and the time is right. Um, so Mike Danning, he was another American expat. Uh, mm-hmm. He has a ton of, of roles in, uh, in Japanese genre movies. He's in Rodan. Oh. He is in, uh, he's in, you mentioned Monster from the Prehistoric Planet. He's in that movie. He's in um, Mighty Jack, which will be of uh, of uh, interest to Mystery Science Theater three thousand fans. He was in Gecko Kamen, which was the first uh, like Japanese superhero TV show. Uh huh. And and this one amused me. He's in Agent X two Underwater Operation along with Peggy Neal. So the two of them obviously had worked together <laughs> a little yes. bit before. <laughs> I do want to bring up the other, uh, um, I guess, I don't know if he was American, the other uh, Caucasian actor, Uh, Dr. Berman, who basically just sits around and lets Dr. She and talks with Dr. Shiota throughout the film and Mm -hmm. ends up with Dr. Lisa. And he is played by an actor named Franz Gruber. And did, that's the did only he, reason what, why wasn't he, was he in that whole Nakatomi thing uh, a while yeah, back? Yeah, you know? exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and it's weird because the, the American dub of this film ha- has all of the uh, Caucasian actors dubbed with a German accent. <laughs> Which makes me <laughs> wonder day. if there was some sort of German, like I said, there was some sort of German money in this. Yeah, I, I will. I will make the same joke I made when Chris Honeywell and I did uh, did uh, Legend of Dinosaur and Monster Birds. When Germany and Japan get together, you know, not, nothing <laughs> yes. good's going to come out of that. You know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh man, Franz Do we know who the, who the suitmation actor was? I let me see if it has it on Wikizilla. I did not find reference to that. I, I have to assume it was one of their uh, uh, a stuntman. Because we have was, to give this man credit. Chichu. Ah, here we go. There is. It is Yukio Odagiri. Okay. Who plays the monster Giyawa. And uh, up, well, okay, it- so a quick a quick search on Google reveals mm-hmm. that uh, apparently he was. He eventually became, if it's the same guy, a a Japanese uh, Olympian for men's featherweight boxing in 1976. It can't be the right guy, though, because he was born, it says born 1956. I don't think he was 11 playing Giala. That can't be right. Okay, okay. Not yeah. the, I was about to say... We are not making any more jokes about Giala in this film. <laughs> yeah, I don't, it, that 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 is that is uh, his character, but who this uh, who this individual is, I do not know. <laughs> but you got to you got to give him credit cuz this is like I said as we've said, arguably the silliest costume in any kaiju movie. Mm, yes. And the guy tries. <laughs> I, yeah. I know it sounds like I'm making fun of him, but no, the guy the guy tries to make this ridiculous looking creature menacing. Yeah, I I I agree with you because the, of of all of the monsters, the like Showa era monsters, Giala reminds me of. There's an ultra monster named Giango, and mm-hmm. Giango is similarly strange and silly looking, but Giango was played for laughs. And 
and you only need about, you know, three to five minutes of monster footage in a 22-minute episode of Ultraman. So right. you can kind of get away with that a little bit. Whereas here, there are large patches of this film where it's just Giala stomping around a model, you know, mm-hmm. for you know four or five minutes at a clip with no dialogue and no, you know, very limited music. You know, <laughs> so it's like it, it's all fallen down on him to uh, to carry the drama of the uh, of of the the uh, the event. So. What is this movie about, Luke? It it is a question that has perplexed men for decades. <laughs> I th- I think I, I I think that the elevator w- pitch was don't mess with outer space uh, shaving cream, mm-hmm. or a giant chicken will mess up. And frankly, I mean that message is as true net today as it was in 1967. So. <laughs> I, 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 I will say this, and this may explain a little bit about this movie. There, there is a note on Wikizilla that, mm-hmm. originally, that the intention for this film, early drafts, I'm going to read it straight from Wikizilla, early drafts for the film okay. featured gigantic, monstrous plants as the antagonist before Giala was created to replace these abandoned creatures. If you take this movie and you reimagine it with, you know flora instead of fauna you know basically a kaiju day of the triffids yes yep i was thinking day of the triffids maybe a little bit of the monolith monsters in there as well Mm -hmm. this makes so much more sense you know um but you know what i i don't always need my kaiju movies to make a ton of sense (laughs) good thing too yeah (laughs) Oh yeah, with this one. Yeah, but however, I want to say there is one I, I, another thing I want to say that that I really enjoyed was Taku Izumi's music. I love that crazy space jazz. I thought that crazy space jazz was fun. I, I love that we we are about as far from Ikura Ikura Ifakube as possible. It's <laughs> it's like it's sometimes it's like theremin and sometimes it's blame it on the bossa nova. It is it is yeah, wonderful. Yeah. It is wonderful. And they hit you right at the front and, and too. <laughs> once again, people will think I'm making a joke, but I'm not. It was it was actually genuinely enjoyable hearing yeah. hearing that music. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm reminded again on the last episode my brother and I talked about the score to Godzilla's Mech Godzilla and there's the the jazz mm-hmm soundtrack which is like that really stands out you know and it and it's very memorable for that reason but uh, oh absolutely <laughs> so what is this movie about let let's get into the synopsis because the only way to explain it is to explain it so the fuji astro flying Sa- oh i should say that our our synopsis is adapted from wikizilla so credit to wikizilla for this uh the the fuji astro flying center which will be fafc which sounds like a soccer team. Um, mm-hmm. The FAFC in Japan is determined to land a spaceship on Mars. All previous attempts have failed, with the crews reporting UFO sightings before they disappeared. FAFC selects Captain Kazuo Sano, space biologist Dr. Lisa Schneider, there you go, Dr. Shiota, and signal officer Hideo Miyamoto to investigate in the nuclear powered AAB Gamma. So that covers maybe the first, you know, first little bit of the film. We meet the cast. They get a briefing. You know, it's uh-huh. a Japanese movie, so we got to have a briefing and explain what's going on. And then they they uh, they're going to launch the shuttle. So um, you you mentioned uh, um, Miyamoto being a creeper, and he wastes yes. no time creeping on Doctor Lisa as soon as the briefing is done. And it is so awkward looking at it now, just so awkward. So yeah, um, and of course, Doctor Lisa has eyes only for Sano. Yeah, and then they have to stop at the moon because they see a flying um, piece of non bread. Yeah, so the UFO. Let's let's explain this. So they launch 
Okay, so they launch it. I, I actually, I have to say, I do like the rocket base, the FAFC rocket base. That is a pretty there's neat, a, that's a pretty a neat nice, set. There's a really nice Thunderbirds feel to it. Yeah. My my note was that it was more like, it's not really Toho, but it's more like, uh, like Dai or Subaraya. It's kind of like what you'd see on an Ultraman show. You know? Right. And but I but I like it. It it looks it's it's got really smooth movement, you know. That when the rocket lifts mm-hmm. off and stuff, I was like, okay, that's pretty decent. That looks pretty good. Uh, and the AAB Gamma itself is a fairly interesting looking ship with its kind of like sled underneath its uh, hull and stuff. Yeah. But then we get to then we get to the piece of bread. Yeah, so they they encounter the UFO, it jams their transmissions, and everything kind of goes, everything kind of goes to uh, goes to heck in a handbasket here because uh, Doctor Shiota suddenly falls ill. Uh, Doctor Sano ref- or um, Captain Sano refuses to treat him for attempting to pursue the craft, which easily outspeeds them, and so they have to make an emergency landing at the moon base, and the moon base. Okay, let's talk about the UFO. Like I said, it is a piece of bread, and it's never shown clearly. You know, you notice that every time you see it, it's like they've—it's mm-hmm. like it's a flashback or it's a, a love scene because they've smeared There's vaseline this big on the lens. Orange smear over it. Yeah. To kind of obscure what it looks like. Is it? I mean, I mean, the only thing I can think is that they weren't. I mean, maybe it was going for mysterious. Mm-hmm. Because as we find out, you know, I understand, you know, UFOs and aliens are mysterious things, but this one's really mysterious because we find out nothing about it for the remainder of the film. Right. Uh, which is astounding to me that you introduce this plot point, and then this was the one I like. Not only do you introduce this plot point, then you've got a whole discussion back on Earth about, mm-hmm. well, maybe the UFOs are controlled from Earth. Making like this whole Cold War reference that is never followed up. Mm. On. <laughs> nope, nope, because because we got to get to the space shaving cream. Yep. But uh, before we even get to the space chicken, we get to the moon base, moon base MSC, where uh, Shiota's diagnosed with space sickness by Doctor Steen. Um, mm-hmm. who again, as we said, builds funny creatures, and we meet yes. Michiko, who is the air oh. traffic controller. Uh, is it really an air traffic controller in space? No, no, I don't think so. It would be but a space I have a question traffic for controller. You. <laughs> yes, that's true. Do you think that Moon Zero Two is just over the rise? I think it kind of has to be, doesn't it? I mean, you know. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I assume that that uh, you know maybe, maybe the little cartoon from the beginning of Moon Zero Two is happening at some point before we arrive there. You know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that that's the other thing. As you, you and I have had um, disagreements in the past about uh, the cultural impact of MST3K. But as I was watching this film, I was like, why didn't um, Joel and the bots have their hands in this? <laughs> I'm serious. This, oh. this, this film is tailor-made because there, there are these long pauses. Yes. It's tailor made to be riffed on. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because that you know that that's that's always because you and you and I both big. We're both for the peek behind the curtain listeners. We're both big uh, MST three K fans. There's no no real question about that. Um, one of the one of the criticisms that I often hear leveled at the sci fi years, especially season eight, mm-hmm. is that because they were picking movies that had to be science fiction movies or monster movies. That there was a lot of movies mm-hmm. that were more boring, more so than cheesy. Yeah. And that there was a lot of, you know, just not a lot going on because there's a lot of talking. This movie, you know, what, is, what does my brother always say? Don't be boring. This movie's not boring. You know, there's always no. something no. happening. It may not make any sense, but there's always something happening. And with as, as crazy as some of the, uh, and as colorful as this is, Moon Zero Two is a great comparison. Because Moon Zero Two has that definite Western I mean, Western in both yeah. senses of the, the word, right? Western part of the world, but also mm-hmm. it's like a space Western, um, you know, uh, 
uh, approach and uh, sensibilities, whereas this is a very much trying to be a straight-laced Japanese science fiction film, except <laughs> it's also got a space chicken and blame it on the bossa nova and uh you know swiveling chairs and a moon base and like the art deco moon base with all the domes and, and, and parties don't yeah. forget the moon party oh yeah you gotta have the parties it's very swinging here in in this version of japan yeah it's it's very it's very of its time it is it is very much a film of of the late 60s with the with the um the the dress Oh, the yeah. off-duty dressing of of the characters in the on the moon base, uh, and the the amount of cocktails. There's cocktails, you know. There's oh, gambling, yes. you know. <laughs> so, and they also uh, handle nuclear materials like they were, uh, you know, outdoor coolers. <laughs> Well, you know, some of, some of them Yeti coolers, man, they're they're really solidly yep. constructed, you know. <laughs> I don't know about you, but down here, Yeti's like a like a, almost a religion. <laughs> Indiana Jones could hide in one of those. Oh yeah, if Indiana Jones had been in a Yeti cooler, he'd have been uh, he'd have been good to go, man. But uh, yeah, so um, so Doctor Shiyoda gets uh, he he has the space sickness. Which made me think of Space Madness from Ren and Stimpy. Right. Um, but he gets replaced with Dr. Steen. And after that little jaunt to the who, moon base... Who only wants to talk about having dinner with his wife. Yes. And it's there's no, and again, there's no path because we never see his wife. Right. What, one way or the other, his wife has either got to be like, you know, like slamming hot or, you know... You know, just like a like a like a comically German Frau line of some kind, right? But no, we never get to see her. <laughs> um, well, the only is thing such we know a, is that she yeah. sure can cook. That's the only thing we know. Yes. Yep. The um, the other thing I like about the moon base is that we get to see everybody bathing. Oh God, yes. <laughs> and you know, okay, so the two. So Sano and Miyamoto are are in the the bath, like like it's you know it's a Japanese moon base because they have a bathhouse, right? Because right. you know that's that's just what it is. So that's that that I mean that to me is uh, when I was like okay that's from a cultural standpoint I kind of see that. I'm not sure again how the gravity works, but we're going to accept that elsewhere in the film uh-huh. too. But then we got to have Lisa and Machiko with the communal shower, <laughs> and it's like. Uh, oh, you know what that for all the world, what that reminded me of is, you know, when Doctor No, when they're decontaminating yes. Bond and uh, mm-hmm. and Honey, and they're sending them down the conveyor belt, just spraying them with more and more mm-hmm. stuff, and then the guy at the end with the squeegee, who is like mm-hmm. the greatest job in the world, <laughs> <laughs> it's like Bill, you're on squeegee duty this week. <laughs> um, it, it's. It's funny because it se- it's like I, all I was thinking of because you know, um, was I watch unfortunately a lot of prison movies? <laughs> is that th- that scene only served two purposes? One, to give us attractive women, um, not bikini girls, sadly, Mm-mm. but um, and two to set up. The soap operatics. Yes. Yeah. That kind of are imposed on the film at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it that it's a love triangle that doesn't really work because near as yeah. I can tell, Sano's not interested in either of them. You know? At least not at this point. <laughs> no, no. Sano is just square jawed hero guy. Yeah. He's all business. He is all business, you know, like the business bear. I mean, uh I, I don't know. At, at one point on the moon base, uh, who is? I think it's Miyamoto says this is groovy. <laughs> all, all we need is Adam Westenberg war like, <laughs> climbing up the side. <laughs> oh, and and, and and the other one, the other note I had. Okay, so they're eating and they've got the giant 
the giant fruits and vegetables, because I guess the lower pressure mm-hmm. on the moon means they can grow giant produce. And so we've got everybody eating, and Dr. Lisa is the one serving all the food. Yeah, yeah, and she also serves the drinks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the um, the food in the in the gamma AAB or AAB gamma. Yep. And um, the coffee. Well, I mean, sure, she's she's a she's a doctor, but she's also a woman. I mean, come on, right? Am I right, yes. guys? You know. <laughs> it's uh, not not you know it, it's it's very funny when I. Uh, you know, we, we hear, and, and and I'm not, this is not a, a criticism, but you look at films from the 50s or 60s, and you look at the mm-hmm. changing attitudes going into the 70s and, you know, through on to the day. And then you look at Japanese films, and it's like, yeah, yeah, they're not really interested in changing much. No, they're, they're pretty happy with it. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we found our groove, and we're going to stick in it. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. So, uh, with Dr. Steen replacing Dr. Shiota, they get back. Uh, on their mission, and um, they get, uh, with the AB Gamma back in space, they get uh, hit with a bunch of asteroids, uh, with one uh, punching a hole in the hull, which is, the depressurization is stopped by Miyamoto's rear end. <laughs> I feel Somebody the need... is coming back without an ass. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel the need at this point to add that I am not making this up. That's that no, is the no. part that I want to I want to stress. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, that I I don't. I mean, I again, I get that this is supposed to be. I, it's almost as if this is like a parody of just science fiction in general, because I don't mm. know what purpose that serves. And and they don't. And and they they solve it by by throwing a valve. What is that doing? I, <laughs> I, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. So they, um, they, so they get the hole supposedly sealed. Uh, the UFO appears again, and uh, it uh, grabs AAB Gamma with its tractor beam, and hmm. so Sano decides, you know, I'm gonna cut. I'm just gonna, you know, instead of fighting against this thing, we need fuel to get back. So. Uh, Sano turns the engine off, but S- Dr. Steen, Dr. Stein, Steen, whichever, <laughs> he, he goes crazy and seizes control of the ship for about a minute. <laughs> and I, and when I'm saying this, gentle listener, I don't mean like an episode of Transformers where Starscream enacts a coup and then Megatron mm-hmm. puts him down in the same scene. I mean, S- Stein does this, and then they forget about it immediately, because then the UFO leaves, and in the next scene, no one seems to remember that he, like, violently uh, took control of the ship. It's just forgotten. I, I really thought I had missed something when I was watching this. I'm like, oh, I must have I looked away and missed something. Nope. Nope. Nothing there. I don't. I don't so know. Th- there is now some some space shaving cream on yes. the the uh, the backward the engines in the back of the AAB Gamma. So is it Doctor Lisa? It's Sano and Doctor Lisa do a little go EVA. out yeah. to investigate. Yes, and, and I uh, I like that we got an EVA. I thought that was pretty neat. You know mm-hmm. because. Um, I was trying to think if there was any Toho films where we got an EVA uh, with the uh-huh. Toho films that were in space. And it's like, there's not one in Monster Zero. There's not one uh-huh. in um, in Destroy All Monsters. So it's like, that was... I, I, I did, I have to admit, I said, from this, as odd as this film is, it does do some creative stuff before it gets, you know, when, when, it's, when it's still, still kind of leaning more to the science fiction side rather than the monster movie side. And doing the EVA, I thought, was was neat. I thought it was interesting, too. This is 1967. Next year is 1968. And what comes mm-hmm. out in 1968 but the green slime. Right. Which has a lot With of people Lucio in space Paluzzi suits. in that, uh... Those yeah. outfits, yeah. Yeah, the silvery jumpsuits. <laughs> Um, way, way, way back in hallowed antiquity. 
my brother and I covered that on this very podcast. You want to go back and listen mm-hmm. to uh, uh, the Green Slime Great episode. But uh, yeah, so they go, they EVA, and they take a sample of um, the uh, the foam and some type of spore thing in the middle, and then they remove the, la- the rest. And then who shows up to save them but Machiko, who is uh, thrilled that she has to come save uh, Dr. Sano and his uh, supposed German girlfriend. Yes, yes. (laughs) (laughs) They play the whole uh, Michiko, Dr. Lisa thing so weird because it's like one scene, Dr. Lisa is obviously like hating on her. Mm -hmm. And the next she's giving her jewelry. Mm Mm-hmm. It's it's a very peculiar. Div- it's obvious what they were going for, but right. how they carried it out was very peculiar. the The thing that was so odd about me is that about no to me about this I should say is oh. that I really got the feeling that Doctor Lisa had to be like eight to ten years older than Machiko. Like it almost because Machiko looks so young. That it's almost like she's like a junior officer, and Doctor Lisa is yeah. like a senior officer, and it's like, oh, that's cute, you know, you know, like because she kind of, like you said, when she gives her the jewelry and some of the stuff on Earth, it's almost like she's kind of doting on her, like she's yeah. a younger sister type, and it's like, are they really in competition? It really seems like it's just kind of misplaced, is to what, but it's like at the same time, it's like that, but that's not the story that they end up telling. It's just kind of how I'm looking at it. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, but so Machiko goes, and we get to see the whole big spacesuit thing, which is which is uh is pretty neat. Um, uh, mm-hmm. back on back on Earth, the doctors, Doctor Kato and Doctor Berman of FAFC, they take charge of the sample. Mm-hmm. Uh, but forget all that science stuff. We got to have a cocktail party to uh, mark the <laughs> celebrate celebrate the astronauts' return. I was expecting them to throw their key, their car keys into a bowl. <laughs> Oh man, that's the uh, that's that's the new version of X from Outer Space, right? You know, <laughs> <laughs> the triple X from Outer Space. Triple X from Outer Space. Uh, I think we can all, um, you know, I, I think every somebody would probably say Roger Moore's line from the end of Moonraker, or excuse me, not Roger Moore's line, uh, Desmond Llewellyn's line. He's attempting reentry, sir. You reentry. Know? <laughs> so- <laughs> So, so we have more Bossa Nova. Yeah. Um, but the, the party yeah. is short-lived because something happens back at the base. Oh, yes. And and I'll be honest with you, as, as interested as I was in how actually the story progresses once they get back to Earth, I could have watched that cocktail party for like another 30 minutes because it's like... <laughs> it, it It's like the lost episode of Mad Men or something go, is, is happening in the middle of this film. But um, but they go back to so back in the base, um, you know. Uh, there's another, another. I'm gonna shout out to another podcast I really like the uh, the Grind Bin because Ridley mm-hmm. Scott, you hack. Because what happens is that the alien spore eats through the floor of the laboratory. It's like mm-hmm. you know a full decade plus before Alien, we're mm-hmm. we're, we're we're eating through the floor with uh, with the with some type of acid. Um, and, uh, so it, 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 the, the, the spore burns a hole through the floor, leaving the insulating material, the foamy stuff behind Dr. Sano or Captain Sano finds a chicken like footprint on the floor. <laughs> Not chicken like it looks like, I mean, it looks like, you know, it's, it's like animaniacs. He's a chicken. I tell you a giant chicken. I mean, a really see, giant I, chicken. I, I, we, you think we're making fun of how of the, the costume, calling it, sh- implying that it's shoddy by calling it a giant chicken costume. But they draw attention to it in the film itself. Yeah, they mention it looks like a giant bird foot. Yeah, I mean that, that's what I mean. That this, that, that this is too on the nose not to be to be self aware. You know, this hmm. is it's. It's it's skirting that line between camp and you know um, 
trying to think even what the other side of that is because it's 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 not full out what we would might think of camp from like 1967 it's not mm-hmm. you know batman but it's very close mm-hmm. to it in a lot of ways because it does it 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 embraces the ridiculous aspects of it and is not ashamed of it you know it puts it out there it's not it's i mean it's it's having fun but at the same time it's still kind of being serious so it's like i it's I don't know that camp had ever. I mean, I know camp caught mm-hmm. on in Japan, but it's like I didn't know that it was by this point. But I that that's the only way you can kind of take this. Mm-hmm. So, so they uh, they find the chicken footprint, and uh, very shortly near uh, afterwards, a nearby power plant begins to experience voltage issues, and Sano, Lisa, Machiko, and Miyamoto watch a giant monster emerge. From beyond a, a a hill in the distance, and this is our first look at Giala. And uh, they compare the footprints with the one left in the lab, and they say this is in fact the monster. It's just grown giant from absorbing energy. And as you referred to, they um, we uh, they they call him Giala for no discernible reason. Right. Yeah. They just say this is what we've decided to call him, and everyone says okay. It would be kind of funny if somebody in the back said, uh, how about we just call him, like, uh, you know, Vortasaur? Yeah. <laughs> how about Vortasaur? It's like, nope, we voted, sorry. You missed it. Because it, it, it's, it's, Gilala sounds like somebody from, you know, the Jersey Shore. Yeah. <laughs> He's hey, not, it's not exactly an intimidating name. <laughs> Hey, Giala, get your crap out of here, man. <laughs> hey, don't be touching my stuff, huh? <laughs> Make a whole different movie right there. Why? Why is... Oh, what was what was her name? The little tiny munchkin creature. Snooky? In the Jersey Shore. Snooky! Yeah. What's behind the beef between Snooky and Gilala? <laughs> Find out next week. <laughs> Well, really, it's actually the, the, what. Yeah, what what you then find out is that they form two sides of a love triangle with uh, Captain yeah. Sano, and it just got weirder from there. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> see, I would pay to see that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're gonna, you know, I mean, what's the difference between reality TV and regular TV? The right, the writers are non-union, right? That's the only difference. Why not? Right. You know, go for it. So. Oh, man. So, uh, Giala stomps towards Tokyo, and uh, FAFC advises the government that the insulating material, Galalanium, Gialanium, may contain the key... Call... Yeah. Let's just call it MacGuffin. <laughs> MacGuffinium. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, have you, uh, are you familiar with the movie The Core? I am from. I am vaguely familiar with it. There is a. There is a. Uh, a one of the conceits of that movie is that the the ship that they make is powered mm-hmm. by a magical metal, and the the professor actually calls it unobtainium in the movie. Well, that, that's a, that's a, a long tradition in science yeah. fiction, going back to uh, the days of Gernsback mm-hmm. of calling. A miracle element, unobtainium. Yeah. So, um, you know, James Cameron can I can say no, I didn't rip that off. I was <laughs> honoring a tradition. Yeah, f- you. Anyway. Well, you know, it's the difference between homage and rip off, right? It's like if your movie costs right. more than ten million dollars, it's an homage. If it costs less, it's a rip mm-hmm. off. Um, so. We get the first of uh, we start getting our our effects she- our effects uh, uh, sequences and shots here. There is some very interesting double exposure work mm-hmm. where we get the uh, double exposure, kind of like a Burt I. Gordon sort of type of uh, approach with Giala double uh, double exposed uh, on top of footage of people fleeing. You know, traditional Daikaiju mm-hmm. stuff. Again, for oh, although assuming, none of the. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, for what I'm assuming is not a large budget, it's not bad. It's, uh, cer- no, it's, it's certainly kind of on good. a Subaraya level. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's 
done on a Bird Eye Gordon budget, but not without the Bird Eye Gordon incompetence. Yeah. <laughs> so. I'd also like to point out Bird Eye Gordon generally worked in black and white, which helps matters a little bit, you know. Yeah. But look at those last two films he made. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, Empire of the Ants and uh, Food of the Gods. Yeah. Those are rough. Yeah, yeah. Empire of the Ants is, is, is a little rough, even before they have the ant farting on people to control their brains. <laughs> well, you know, Tabitha does that all the time. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. Again, I'd like to point out that I am... I want you to go away! <laughs> <laughs> what are you what are you gonna do with a cat you know that's what they do but yeah, um, exactly. yeah. so Not feed them pastrami that's for sure yeah yeah that's the, that's the truth uh so we get all um, like we said we get long sequences of uh giala stomping around models being attacked by tanks and jets and it's mm-hmm. it is just very straightforward a, a kind of cool there's a kind of cool damn sequence because mm-hmm. it seems like it's not a kaiju movie without a kaiju destroying a dam. Oh yes, yep. Yeah, there's a, there's a, yeah. Then, then, then you know that the model work is it's not bad. It's not, like I said, it, no. it reminds me a lot of an episode of Ultraman. It's about that level. Mm-hmm. And considering that this was their first and only foray into uh, giant monsters, that's not bad. You know. Mm-hmm. And so I'm again. It's 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 charming in its own way. Even as you're watching, it's like, okay, th- this is you know this this is clearly not on the same level as what they're doing across the street at Toho, you know? Right. Because let's see, sixty-seven. That's Son of Godzilla, you know. And Son of Godzilla, right. a, a low-budget film for Toho, but you know the the level of complexity of the effects and all that is certainly a much greater even being set on a tropical island without the uh the, mm-hmm. the urban setting but you know again for for a first time out I, it's it's pretty well done and i said it's not it's 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 not super original but the genre itself is not super original when it comes to monsters destroying cities you know that that was bread right. and butter of the genre all right hmm. So they they bring back the Guilalanium. Yep. From space. And yeah. They... The, I, and I am always impressed at how quickly in movies we can turn around launching a spaceship. Yes. <laughs> it takes NASA weeks and weeks to do that. We can do it like land, refuel it, take back off. Um, yeah. So yeah, they and they... um. They need more time, though, to fuel to put the, the galanium in the fighter jets. Yep. So, uh, Sano and his buddy take another Yeti cooler full of radioactive material on a and pickup go truck. Go driving. Yeah. <laughs> and go driving to lure Gilala away. And the perspective is all all messed up in this one in this uh, sequence. Yeah, yeah. It just yeah. Basically, they 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 take the the uh, the nuclear fuel, the XTU nuclear fuel, and put it in a little cooler and drive around with it. And Giala chases them. Um, it's I, I don't I don't know if I'd be saying that this is probably the best known part of this film, but it probably is the best known part of this film with Giala just swiping at him endlessly. Yeah. But it's like, this is, there's all sorts of, these guys are going to be in a world of hurt if they survive this giant monster attack. Yes. You know. Yes. But luckily, they managed to fuel the jets and the jets get up in the air and they enact the last scene in The Wizard of Oz? <laughs> and Kyala kind of like waves his arms around going, I'm melting, I'm melting in kaiju Yep. And down he goes into a, a big foamy mess. Yes. Although I gotta, I gotta say, when I watched this as, as Little Tom in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, I was doing so on a black and white TV. Mm-hmm. And there are certain films that look kind of ludicrous in color. 
that look kind of nightmarish in black and white, and mm. seeing this creature basically seem to grow some sort of disease and die. Yeah. In black and white, where, every, where it looked kind of grungy and nasty, was pretty scary to young Tom. Oh, I can I can totally see that. You know the uh, the ending of this it it very much reminds me of the end of the uh, the Korean film Yangari Monster from the Deep, where I believe they douse Yangari with kerosene. I think is what they douse him and, with. Yes. Yeah, and he bleeds to death. Another film that I first <laughs> saw. On the 4.30 movie. Ah, good old Yangari. Gotta yes. love it. <laughs> but uh, Yangari. Yeah. So, and, and another film that got a modern color remake slash sequel, sort of. Yes. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so Giala uh, dies and um, he get well, he doesn't so much die. He gets, like, shrunk back down into a spore. And they... Uh, they 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 get the they they don't actually show us, but they're gonna take him back to space because in the vacuum of space it can't get any energy, and it will uh-huh. stay dormant and they'll protect the uh, protect the Earth, and that's when we get the I, I guess from a literary standpoint it would be the climax of our uh, love triangle, mm-hmm. but nothing's really satisfied because Lisa hanging out with Doctor Berman. Uh, the, you know, says he's not going to tell Sano that she's in love with him, but Machiko, uh, you know, gets to, gets to, you know, get the, get her man at the end of it with, with Sano mm-hmm. and it's a happy ending. So, you know, yeah. monster, monster defeated. And, and Dr. Lisa goes off to, to California, presumably with doc, with Franz Groover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's your idea of Christmas. Uh, I can't wait to see New Year's, you know. <laughs> this is not great, but it's fun. It is. And there the thing is, is there's so many weird little sidetracks and tangents in this movie. Mm-hmm. During the whole thing with the um when, when they're they're trying to get the the Gialanium back, they keep cutting to like the general and he keeps getting more and more disheveled. As more Why can't more... we have that collenium? <laughs> and he keeps answering the phone with his like heavy sighs, like <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> And then he's so excited when they get it. And and then yes. when when FAFC gets attacked, we get this whole thing with Dr. Lisa's leg being pinned under a vessel oh, under a tank. God. And all I was thinking was you have some serious crush injuries there. Yeah. Yeah, that's not good. You know, it's like back in the 60s, young Tom, and a lot of people didn't know about crush inju- injuries as much. Mm-hmm. So they didn't realize how really messed up Dr. Lisa should have been. Oh, yeah. Because Dr. Lisa is able to walk on that leg immediately. Right. Well, that's the thing that, I'll be honest with the thing that got me, Okay, I, I work in industrial mm-hmm. settings. Okay, I, I know about you know okay. crush injuries and that kind of stuff, and it makes it actually as an aside, it makes it really it makes it really difficult for me to laugh at like you know supposedly ridiculous safety videos because all I see are the actual mm-hmm. the actual things of how that would work in real life, and it, it's very hard for me right. to watch. But um, so they the, the the thing falls on her, her ankle is pinned and she's stuck, and they're getting it up by using boards to lever the vessel up. Mm-hmm. And then one of the boards breaks and it falls back on her. And it's like, well, that's the end of that. That foot's coming off at this point, right? I mean, there's... You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ouch. Just ouch. I, I also like the... You know. uh, there's a uh, there's an aside with... Um, with, uh, you know, who is it? It's uh, with uh, Kato and Berman, where they just mm-hmm. casually toss out that they, um, that no, that none of the allies are willing to drop an atomic bomb because America doesn't want to drop another atomic bomb on Japan. <laughs> one line of first dialogue. First one, our, our bad, our yeah. bad. That first one. But but we're not gonna. We, we'd rather not do it again. Even though you've, you're asking us to, we will. Yeah. We wouldn't feel right. It would it would feel like yeah. you know kicking somebody. 
Yeah, it's, it, you gotta, you know, it, again, it's it's a Showa Daikaiju movie. There has to be some type mm-hmm. of reference to, to the A bomb, you know. And I should, I, I had I had a joke ready for for us talking about the uh, Doctor Lisa pinned under the thing, mm-hmm. which of course uh, we've passed. But I just want to say she would be going from Peggy Neal to Peg Leg O'Neill. Oh no. <laughs> Maybe she can get the machine gun leg like Rose McGowan in uh, Planet Terror. Okay, okay, you know, Peg, Peggy Neal with a, with a machine gun leg and a pet kaiju. I'd, pe- I'd watch that. <laughs> I'd watch the hell out of that. Where's the I'd Kickstarter? And, and, and they're going from, in a post-apocalyptic world, they're going from, like, tribe to tribe. <laughs> Kind of like Planet Terror meets, find, meets the she's... modern version of Devil Dinosaur, yeah. Yeah, and she's got to find exactly. She's got to find a place to hide, Guilala, <laughs> because they don't. She doesn't want to upset people, but but they they they, they try to take advantage of her, and, and Guilala comes comes going and throwing out those fireballs, and yeah, I, I I'm gonna put it on the list of movies I'm gonna make. One of these days. One of these days. Look out for... Uh, everybody keep an eye out for the Kickstarter coming from Thomas sometime in, yes. in the near future. Or the audio drama. I could do Audio drama. Do, I could do the news in audio drama. Absolutely. I've got it's the much cheap. Well, you know, Daikaiju is much cheaper in an, in an audio medium. I'm just going to put that out there. You can make the oh, sets as had, fantastic as you want. <laughs> we had... Uh, earlier last year... We had a Bigfoot fighting a demon bird. That we did. It so. was and it was and it was wonderful. <laughs> Every now and again I, I have that still saved on my uh on my MP three app on my phone. Every now mm-hmm. and again it just comes up on the randomizer and I'm like, ah yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I have to admit, uh that is one of the uh productions I'm the most proud of of directing. Mm. Um, but I should save this all for the, where can they find you, Tom? Segment. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. So I, I've got to ask, I, I, I think I know what the answer is, but Thomas, what do you think of the X from outer space, AKA giant space monster Giala? I think it is a good, it, it's a good party movie. Mm-hmm. It is a good party movie for for you and a bunch of guys to hang out and 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 have it on the television screen, and every once in a while look at it and laugh because it's it's fun. It's it has a certain. I, I like to refer to these films as the films that tried. Yeah, <laughs> where you, you recognize they are not good on an objective level. But there's so much effort and so much um, personality put into them that you can't be mad at them. Yeah. If that makes a lick of sense. Mm-hmm. You know, there so, is... Yes, uh, I, mm-hmm. I, yeah. I would yep. recommend The yep. X from Outer Space. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. It's Like I said, it's... You know, there are... Yeah. There, there, there's different flavors to Daikaiju, right? I mean, most of the Toho films mm-hmm. uh, were, were, were fairly straightforward, serious. I mean, Shiniki Sekizawa stuck some some lighter touches in there, and there were some other things that, you know, some other ones that had, you know, maybe a little bit harder edges to them. The Gamera mm-hmm. films tend to skew, especially by this point, by 67, were skewing mm-hmm. younger, you know. Um, we think about this, all the sequels after uh, Berrigan, we're all kind of you know, skewing younger. This one, really, it's it's such an odd duck or odd chicken, I should say, right? Because it's yeah. it is it is legitimately trying to be a science fiction film at some parts, but the other parts, it's kind of winking and having a really fun time with it, and it's 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 very enjoyable. Even as you say, objectively, it's like this is not a good movie, but it is it is a lot of fun, and it's very enjoyable to watch, especially if you're already. You know, a, a, a Japanese you know science fiction or monster fan. It's just gonna it's just gonna yeah. tickle your your funny bone, I think. Um, and I, and I will say, if you do want to see it, 
that uh, we we've referred to it a couple of times. It is the uh, criteria the Criterion Eclipse series number thirty seven. When horror came to uh, Shoki- Shochiku, it is a a four film set. It has the extra matter space. Um, Genocide, which is one we talked about earlier, which is War of the Insects, The Living the Skeleton, insects. and the um, the one that probably is best known out of this set, Goke Body Snatcher from Hell. So, oh yeah, that yeah, that's a nightmarish one. That one, right? So that I mean, I, I mean, I'll be honest. I I I suspect that that was the one that a lot of people were more excited about outside of Daikaiju fans for, for this set. Mm-hmm. Cause I've, I've never seen genocide or the living skeleton. I've heard some pretty good things about living skeleton. Actually, I've heard some good mm-hmm. things about genocide, but genocide is kind of, it's, it's one of those like, uh, like extinction level event type horror movies is my understanding. But Goke <sighs> body snatcher from hell is kind of the one that's like, you know, that that's when they talk about like early J horror. That's one that gets thrown around a lot. So, Mm-hmm. And um, looking at it right now on Amazon, thirty dollars for those four movies from Criterion. That's that's pretty darn good where I come from. God bless Criterion because they they don't have heirs. Mm. You know, yeah. um, they're willing to do things like like this box set, like the Godzilla box set, like the the box set of biker movies, which also features. Um, one of my favorite films of all time, The Monkey's Head. Ah. So, you know, they're not hoity-toity people. So, so what yeah. did you think of, I, of since yeah. this was your first experience with the X from Outer Space, and don't say it's a guilty pleasure, there's no such thing as a guilty pleasure, it is possible to objectively enjoy something that you recognize as bad, oh. you shouldn't feel guilty about it. Absolutely. No, I like I said, I, I recommend the hell out of this. This this is this was so much fun to watch. Like I said, there, there's so mm. much of this is so goofy and ridiculous, but it's it's it said it it's charming. It's so charming. It's so nineteen sixty seven. In much the same way like we, we mentioned uh, the Green Slime. That the Green Slime is so nineteen sixty eight. I've often said that you know, in 1968, we had 2001 A Space Odyssey and The Green Slime. And somewhere in the middle lies the truth. You know? <laughs> it's it's such a... It's such a... a uh, it, it's so of its time, of the Showa era in Japan. It's it's mm-hmm. hard not to be charmed by it. And I'm... I, w- I had a lot of fun watching this. And, and I am eager to show this one off to, uh, to some friends as well and break out that, that box set. So... Uh, yeah, definitely fun. If you're if you're listening to Earth Destruction Directive, go check it out. And you know what? What I you know this um, a couple of months ago, as we're recording this, I did my first Halloween special on the show, mm-hmm. where I took a look at Vampire Doll, which was the first of the uh, vampire movies, the Dracula trilogy. Yes, yes, from, over at Toho, and it's like part of the reason that I started doing that was that I got the Arrow Bloodthirsty trilogy box mm-hmm. and this Eclipse. Th- series 37 box i'm like okay i'm set up with some vintage j horror now to do on the show here so coming soon in some time in the in the in the far-flung future of a few years from now we will get you know go k body snatch from hell living skeleton genocide we will get those other ones as as guided uh-huh. episodes going forward so you got that to look forward to but uh thomas i want to thank you so much for joining me to talk about the x from outer space it amazes me it took this long for the two of us to sit down one-on-one together. Because mm. yeah, we have such we... a love of yeah. Suitmation. Yeah. Because I said we did we did Who True, Who True Freaks with the, uh, yeah. the, the, the dearly departed and much beloved and missed Sean Engel to talk about uh, Vengeance mm-hmm. on Varos. Right. And, uh, we, and uh, we've... we've done a couple of vaults together. Yeah. Yep, that's right, because we did uh, and, Black and Christmas, and we did uh, Malignant. Malignant, and Captain Kronos we did. Oh, that's right, Captain and, Kronos as well, yes. And uh, also, you were a guest on one of the earliest episodes of the show on Two True Freaks that I co-host with uh, Chris Honeywell, The Honeywell Experiment. That's where we did the other Black Christmas, wasn't it? We did the both other Black yeah. Christmas, yeah. the good one. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
you know, you I know, I, do- I am to, to I, I have to say, I didn't put two and two together at the time, but how has nobody released a parody song? of Last Christmas by Wham and made it about Black Christmas because it's right there, you know. Well, well, let me get to work on that with my new band. <laughs> you know, Black Christmas, I left you for dead. <laughs> You're stuck in so, the attic and nobody knows, you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yeah, so once a month, although we took we took the month of December off, once a month Chris and I examine different uh, grindhouse films in the Honeywell experiment. We've got one for January. We are oh. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows about Necromantic. Yes. The German necrophilia film. But does anybody know about Love Me Deadly, the American necrophilia film from 1971? Mm. Do they want to know about it? That's the question. We're still questioning that ourselves, to be honest. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, the other thing that I do, uh, well, I'm a co-host on Dread Media with Des Reddick, and we are going to be covering uh, in a couple of weeks the entire Critters franchise. Mm. And ask the question, is one of these films objectively the worst movie the two of us have ever seen? <laughs> um, and it's making course, you question it, everything, isn't it? The whole, all, all of your, you know, deeply held tenets and beliefs are being called into question now. Yeah, no this this one is it, it's there, there is one film in that s- series that we actively have to debate whether it was the worst thing we've ever seen together. <laughs> and um, of course, <laughs> um, if you love audio drama, you should check out on Two True Freaks the. Akadekagonagon Theater Works, which, among other things, does uh, adaptations of public domain horror comics. We do adaptations of indie comics. We might have a big announcement later this year. I mean, later next year. Early next year, we're going to have a big... We might have a big announcement, crossing his fingers, as to what our next big adaptation is. But, yeah, and that's, that's just a fun thing of people around the country... And um, when we do, if we decide to do Dr. Lisa and her pet kaiju, I assume I can call on you again. Absolutely. I am your, I, I, I am perfectly fine playing, stepping in as any type of giant monster you need me to play. <laughs> so, so yes. And thank you for having me. This, this is a little bit of nostalgia for me. I love talking about the 430 movie. I love talking about these little tiny things that you discover you discovered at like 1 a.m. on Sunday morning. Yes. Back when all uh, television was terrestrial. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Those, you know, it on, on Two True Freaks, there's, there's quite a, it just happens that it's worked out this way that there's a lot of folks that grew up in New York at the right time where, <laughs> you know, Channel 11, WPIX, Channel 9, WOR, Channel 5, WNYW, those, there's a lot of memories associated with those channels for a lot of, a lot of folks on the network. Can you believe, so. okay, the, the 430 movie has been off the air since I think the 80s. Yeah. And I can still do the theme song. <laughs> da, 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 da. Uh, I... The the one that's the one that's always stuck with me is Channel Nine, the million dollar movie on Channel Nine W O R. I love the million dollar movie. No. <laughs> oh well, well, you and I being monster kids, you also I'm sure have fond memory of Chiller. Oh yeah, Chiller Theater. I, and and that opening that opening credit animation was nightmare fuel. Oh yeah. It it is. I mean, watch it now. Go look it on YouTube. It's still creepy. Yeah. You know. If you if you if you had a VHS tape, if you had a VHS tape that wasn't labeled and you put that in, I don't care what the movie is, you're gonna watch it, you know. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, and and it took me several years to realize that the the hand had six fingers. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. But yeah, no. But yeah, great. And uh, I 
totally down to talk more of this with you at any time you would like to have me back. Oh, absolutely. And thank you very much for allowing me to spread the gospel of Gwilila. <laughs> well, you are, uh, thank you very much for, for joining me. It was a lot of fun. Uh, anytime we'll, you know, any, any t- you know, we'll have to come back at least for Monster X Strikes Back, you know, attack the G8 Summit at some point. We'll oh, yes, of course, that one. of course. Uh, so, you know, you or, or t- maybe we could do the kaiju movie that, uh, Kim, uh, that, that the North Koreans made. Oh yeah. Uh, Pulgasari or Pulgarasi, whatever. Pulgasari, yes. Pulgasari, yeah. Yes. Uh, the, yes. The North Korean movie made with kidnapped Japanese and South Korean talent. <laughs> yes. It's like one of those ones where it's like the movie's interesting, but the story of the movie is where it's at guys. But, uh. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, so thank you. Yeah. And of course, I'd like to remind all of our listeners at Earth Instructor Directive to test negative, stay positive. Ah, uh, yes. Um, that actually uh, just recently came up for me. I uh, was up in Charlotte, North Carolina, the Queen City, to go to the uh-huh. uh, the current Time to Bubble tour for Mystery Science Theater 3000. Mm-hmm. So, uh was uh they were they were in fact checking vaccination or negative tests at the uh, at the door um and was a enjoyable time even though we had to be masked we all laughed our butts off watching uh watching Emily and the bots riff the uh riff the movie making contact which uh apparently <gasps> um, I have seen that thing oh that is bizarre Roland Emmerich's answer to ET yeah, it, it, it's Roland Emmerich's answer to E.T., only Roland Emmerich never understood the question. <laughs> it is so weird. Yeah. Oh, you, you want, anyway. Yeah. As, as, as an aside, the unedited German version of that film is on YouTube, if you want to see the non-American one, the non-cut-down one. All right, so again, thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for joining us. A lot of fun. I want to thank everybody out there for listening to the show. Hope everybody enjoyed it. What do you think? Have you seen The Extra Matter Space? Did you perhaps see it on the 430 movie? Why don't you send me an email, Directive at yahoo.com. We can talk about it here on the show. And, uh, you know, uh, Thomas, I've been doing this thing lately with guests where I just don't tell people what's coming next. And I think I'm going to keep that going. So we'll, we'll keep, this is going to drop in December and we'll keep the mystery going into the new year for as what we're going to cover next. So, uh, yeah, you're, you're going to have to just, you know, sit there next to your, next to your, uh, podcasting machine, just with bated breath, you know, you know, rubbing your hands together, worrying, uh, but, uh, Thomas, again, thank you for being on everyone. Thank you for listening. Yes. Thank you very much. And, uh, I want to remind everyone real quick that of course, earth destruction directive is for everyone. If you are interested in Japanese giant monster culture, you are welcome to be a part of this show in whatever way you feel comfortable. All are welcome here. Uh, again, hope you enjoyed this episode. Please come back next time for whatever we're going to cover then. And until then. Keep them stomping. This has been Earth Destruction Directive, a Daikaiju podcast, produced and created by me, Luke Giaconetti, as part of the Two True Freaks Internet Radio Network, available at twotruefreaks.com. This is a fan work celebrating the history and culture of Japanese giant monsters. All movies, TV shows, comic books, characters, and other intellectual property is copyright their respective copyright holders, and no infringement is intended or implied. If you would like to send an email to the show, you can email me at earthdestructiondirective at yahoo.com. I try to respond to all emails, and if you send in some comments, I will read them on the show. All episodes of Earth Destruction Directive can be found at 2truefreaks.com. You can also find the show on your favorite podcatcher. Just search for Earth Destruction Directive. You can even leave a review on your podcatcher of choice if you'd like. You can find me on Facebook. Just search for first name Luke, last name E-D-D. You can also get in touch with me on Twitter. Just search for the handle at L Jacone. That's L-J-A-C-O-N-E. The theme song for this podcast is Future Gladiator by Kevin McLeod downloaded from Incompetech.com, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0 license. 
Thanks for listening, and be sure to come back next time for more city-stomping fun here on Earth Destruction Directive. Tune in next time to hear the crusty old podcaster from Oklahoma say, There's a WTF (laughs) moment if I ever saw one.